Am I ready to roll it, Nicole? Yes, yes, Ron, you're ready to start. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us today and welcome to our combined Money Smart Alliance and Train to Trainer session for the second quarter of 2022. As today is June 15th, this event also serves to promote World Elder Awareness, Elder Abuse Awareness Day, an important day, of course, reason why we're doing this. Here in the US, June is also National Home Ownership Month. So we'll be touching on the importance of advancing housing security for our nation's older adults as well. In this training session, the FDIC and CFPB will feature our Money Smart for Older Adults product. The MSOA constitutes a joint product, a joint effort between the CFPB and FDIC, and it's aimed at countering the financial exploitation of older adults. We're pleased to note that we have a variety of attendees today joining us, so welcome. Thank you for for uh, being here with us. We have banks, we have advocates, we have various kinds of uh, service providers, um, and we have other stakeholders as well. Some of you are currently members of the Money Smart Alliance, and for those of you who aren't, we hope you join us. It's free to join. Some of you have attended past train the trainer sessions uh, by the FDIC uh, Money Smart team. And if you haven't, we hope you enjoy this one and join future ones uh, down the line. And some of you are champions in the fight against financial exploitation of our nation's older adults. But you might be new to FDIC products. You might be new to CFPB initiatives. We hope that you'll use today's session to join hands to collaborate in the use of Money Smart for older adults, or find other ways, uh, other ways to uh, uh, synergize your efforts aimed at protecting the financial and housing security of our nation's older adults. Uh, next slide, please. Today's webinar will help you make your own Money Smart for older adults outreach and engaging effective financial education and learning experience. So let's review today's agenda. And this presentation will do the following. We'll first describe what Money Smart is and how it serves as a tool to promote financial literacy. We'll then give you a general overview of the Money Smart for Older Adult product so that you can use it to counter financial exploitation of older adults. After that, we'll give you a high level orientation on the topic of reverse mortgages and mobile home ownership in order to promote sustainable housing and home ownership for older adults. Next, we'll provide you with ways to connect with the FDIC and CFPB in order to access additional resources. After that, we'll provide ideas on how you might wish to collaborate with each other and with other stakeholders uh, to advance financial and housing wellness of older adults. We'll take some questions and hopefully provide some answers, and then we'll close out today's training. To keep you engaged throughout the training, please use the chat feature to comment or ask your questions. Please set your chat to all attendees, by the way, or to everyone, so that you're sharing your responses with the entire group. Next slide, please. That's what you'll see when you look at all our uh, Money Smart products. Next slide, please. Today's speakers are my teammates. Fabulous teammates, Nicole Peters and Yolanda Green. Uh, we're all community affairs specialists from the Division of Depositor and Consumer Protection within the Outreach and Program Development section of the FDIC. 
Our co-presenter today is one of our favorites from the CFPB. It's Jennifer Dwayne. She's a program analyst at their office of older Americans. So let's tell you how we'll proceed with today's training session. First, we'll have Jennifer define financial exploitation, what it looks like, who's involved, etc. And then uh, second, we'll have Nicole introduce you to the general content and objectives of Money Smart for older adults. And then she'll inform you how Money Smart products are structured in order to convey financial literacy. After that, Jennifer will return to convey some substantive points on preventing financial abuse via our MSOA product. And then finally, Jennifer will provide an overview on some basic elements of reverse mortgages and mobile home ownership. And then finally, Yolanda will close us out. Please again, uh, use the chat feature to respond or to ask your questions. And towards the end, we'll have um, some time to deal with questions and answers. And during that time, please use the hand raised emoji to ask your questions. But before we begin this uh, preliminary uh, boilerplate stuff uh, on the background of the FDIC, which stands for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Our primary mission is preserving and promoting the public confidence in our nation's U.S. financial system by first ensuring deposits in banks and thrift institutions of at least $250,000. Also by identifying and monitoring and addressing the risks to the deposit insurance fund. And then finally, by limiting the effect on the economy and the financial system when a bank or a thrift fails. The FDIC is an independent federal agency of the federal government created in 1933 in response to the thousands of bank failures that occurred in the 20s and 30s. But since the start of the FDIC insurance program and fund on January 1, 1934, no depositor has lost a single cent of FDIC insured funds as a result of a failure, of a bank failure. The standard insurance amount is $250,000 per depositor per insured bank for each account ownership category. The FDIC directly examines and supervises about 4,000 banks and savings institutions for operational safety and soundness, as well as for compliance of our nation's consumer protection laws. More than half of all financial institutions in the U.S in the banking system are directly supervised by the FDIC. To protect insured depositors, the FDIC responds immediately when a bank or thrift institution fails. And with, and with uh, nothing further ado, I'm going to hand you off to Jennifer. Jennifer, are you ready? And if so, take it away, please. Hi, everyone. I'm here and I hope you can hear me. I'll give you my face for a moment, but then I'm just going to go off camera. <coughs> and I apologize in advance. I have a little teeny bit of an allergy run in here. So I hope I don't cough too much. I'll go off camera now. Um, actually, while I'm on camera, let me just start with a little disclaimer from the Bureau that basically says this presentation is being made by a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau representative, me, on behalf of the Bureau. It does not constitute legal interpretation, guidance, or advice of the Bureau. And any opinions or views, and I'm going to say most opinions or views that are stated by me, are my own and may not represent the Bureau's views. So with that, um, I am seeing, let's hang there on the slide for a second. I just want to give a quickie background on the Office for Older Americans. Um, we are uh, part of the Division of Consumer Education and External Affairs at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, 
one of several uh, special population offices. Um, our uh, mission is to help protect older consumers from financial harm and financial elder financial exploitation would be a major source of that, among other issues. Um, and to help older consumers make sound financial decisions as they age and to help stakeholders such as yourselves by providing tools to support long term financial security for older people. Older adults, older people, we use the terms interchangeably. So, with that, um, and I was remiss in not saying thank you so much, Ron, for the introduction. Um, I'm Jennifer Duane. I'm a senior policy. I'm not a policy analyst. I apologize. I am a program analyst at the CFPB's Office for Older Americans, and we are also a national consumer protection agency. Um, thanks all for joining us today, and and especially for all the work you do or are going to do to help protect older consumers, older people, older Americans from financial harm. And today is an absolutely spectacular day to do that for us to be here together, because as Ron mentioned, it is World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, also known as WEAD. And um, we're gonna talk about this free tool, Money Smart for Older Adults, um, that will help you if you use it, and we trust you well, or you already are, um, in your work to combat elder financial exploitation. Um, we're very, very grateful to the FDIC for a fantastic partnership, super, collabor super collaboration, uber collaboration that has gone on for, boy, we launched the program in June on World Elder Abuse Awareness Day in 2013. So I think we are at a nine year anniversary today. Is that right? My goodness, it seems like yesterday. It's been so much fun and so effective. So first, let's st set the stage by talking about elder financial exploitation, exploitation more broadly. Um, and you, many of you probably know that the studies show that uh, financial exploitation of older people is absolutely devastating and it is pervasive, it is growing, um, and it is massive. Um, the losses to older adults are probably only a fraction, what we estimate may only be a fraction of reality because um, elder financial exploitation and all forms of elder abuse are vastly underreported. So the uh, estimates have ranged from 2.6 uh, billion, which I think is way low, an opinion of mine, by the way, um, to 36.5 billion. And it's hard to know whether, you know, that is all the sort of frauds and scams by people we don't know that are reported on Sentinel data and combined with what little we get from law enforcement about their investigations and prosecutions. There's data as a result of suspicious activity reports that are filed by uh, financial institutions, but those are not substantiated cases. It's just suspicious activities and those numbers are pretty staggering. And then there are um, the reported cases to adult protective services that uh, the numbers vary from state to state. So we really don't have hard numbers, but anecdotally we know that it's everywhere and that um, and some of the studies are pointing to you know many, many billions of dollars and the last couple of years has really intensified with the isolation caused by the pandemic. Older people have been hidden, they've become more vulnerable, um, and uh, it's been, uh, well, not all older people, but many have become more vulnerable as a result of isolation, which is an older person's uh, worst enemy. So if you are part of an elder fraud prevention and response network, which also is known as a multidisciplinary team, a coalition, a task force, or even a financial abuse specialist team, or an SMP, a senior Medicare patrol group, um, you uh, would perhaps, you probably already know a lot of this data, and uh, we're just so grateful to you for all that you do to protect older people from financial exploitation. 
So what you'll hear about is that Money Smart for Older Adults is a great resource as both a train the trainer if you want to or, or have the capacity to or the opportunity to train other people to take this program um, to, the, to the streets, as I say, take it on the road, and train other trainers to get out there with the information, or you can use it individually um, in your interactions with older people just by passing out the resource guides or sharing information there's that's one of the, the beauties of the program and why it's been so successful is because it is malleable it is flexible and you can use it in a variety of uh of settings and arenas so if you are actually currently using money smart for older adults uh, please let us know in the chat i'd love to hear if you are and if you and if you feel like putting your organization name in there as well so that we can uh so we can thank you uh uh, a little more specifically at some point, that'd be great. All right, next slide. Well, hold on before we go. Okay, never mind. You got a sneak preview because um, I jumped the gun there. But this is um, when when Ron said I was going to define elder financial exploitation. This is our definition. And while you're reading that, um, what we usually do, and we've had to really pivot in the last couple of years around how we deliver this information, because it used to be all face-to-face, -face, almost always face-to-face -face with older people, but that has had to change recently. And so regardless of whether you're doing it uh, virtually or in a hybrid setting where it's partially virtual and partially in person or in person, what uh, we strongly recommend as a technique to engage your audience is to ask the question, what is elder financial exploitation? before you show the slide. And then that way, people in person would raise their hand and call out and say, you know, it's theft or it's uh, putting their money, taking money from my pocket and putting it in theirs, or they might even give a type of, of financial exploitation, what type of uh, exploitation it is as a definition. But as you can see here, the definition, and this is under the Older Americans Act, um, and I do recommend that after you've had your sort of interaction with your audience, however you do that in the chat, or if you do that in person or both uh, in a hybrid situation, I think it's really great to read this out loud slowly and with some projection and with a couple of pauses. And the reason I say that is because it helps you to set the tone for the cadence you want to deliver the information to older people. Um, older people are do not need to be spoken to slowly, but they need to hear you, so you need to project your voice. And if you go too fast, even for me nowadays, I just can't take it all in. Being read to is very hard for me. So if they're seeing it on the screen and you are saying elder financial exploitation is the fraudulent or otherwise illegal, unauthorized or improper act or process of an individual that uses your resources for their own personal benefit, profit, or gain. And you can mix it up a little bit. It does not have to be verbatim. Actions that someone else takes that results in you being deprived of your rightful access to or the use of your benefits, your resources, your belongings, and your assets. So, that's just an example of how I used to deliver these slides when I spoke directly to older people and how I train older people to, uh, to sorry, as a, how I train folks such as yourself, intermediaries and stakeholders to deliver the information. Now, before you change the slide, in the chat, what are some examples of elder financial exploitation? What kinds, what, what are some examples? And I'm going to pull up the chat so I can see what your responses are. And once we get past this part, I'll be able to move a whole lot faster. All right, I see nothing. I think you all know the answers. Okay, maybe I'm just not seeing it, but that's all right. Um, so what are some examples of elder financial exploitation? Assuming that you have called out all of these answers, Next slide, please. So uh, exploitation can comes in a lot of different forms. 
um, an agent under a power of attorney or some other fiduciary rela relationship, such as a trustee um, or or a, uh, a guardian or a conservator. Um, these are people who are legally appointed to administer someone else's money, typically someone with diminished capacity or someone who is not a capable of doing so for a number of, of managing their money for a number of reasons. And that could be a short term situation or a long term situation. Um, and it could also be theft of money or property, often by a family member, unfortunately, very often by family members or caregivers or in-home helpers. It can be frauds and scams, including free lunch seminars, decept you know, basically deceptive practices fall under uh, frauds and scams, but investment frauds and scams um, fall under the uh, Securities Exchange Commission. It is still fraud. There's still there are still investment scams out there, actually quite a lot of them. And I think an area that I've been hearing that we've seen a huge increase in frauds and scams, and even involving a lot of older people who are increasingly savvy on the internet, et cetera, is around cryptocurrency. And that is a situation right now that is extremely volatile in the marketplace, unregulated for the most part, and um, and a very, uh, oh, something that a lot of people, including myself, would be very vulnerable to because I don't know a lot about it. I know some about it, but I don't know a lot about it, and it's somewhere where I would not invest. But these scammers are very savvy, and they get people to do it, and that money, that those that those resources can just vaporize because they are not held in an FDIC insured institution. Um, and then of course, lottery and sweepstakes scams, they're still out there. Um, they've been around forever. Um, they'll probably never go away, but a lot of these things sort of change around. Um, uh, they just kind of move with the seasons, whatever's in the headlines or whatever's happening out there. Next slide, please. There's telephone and computer scams. Those are still huge. Lots of uh, callers on the phone, uh, grandparent scams. Uh, uh, the computer scams are like computer repair scams, et cetera. Identity theft is still a really big deal. Um, and it happens a lot uh, to older people. And, it's, and it happens sometimes in different ways to older people. Um, and reverse mortgage fraud, okay? And I wanna be very, very clear that reverse mortgages in of themselves are not a fraud. They're not a scam, but they are an expensive and complicated financial product. And there are folks out there who will defraud older people using reverse mortgages. They'll either talk them into getting them um, and then taking a lump sum and benefiting themselves. Sometimes that's family members, or they will be sold under unfair, deceptive, and abusive marketing practices. Um, and they sometimes are sold as, you know, the best thing since sliced bread and every older person should have one. That is not the case. Reverse mortgages need to be very carefully uh, re researched and investigated. And I would suggest that anytime you're making a, a big financial decision or even a small one, if it affects you as a big one, um, that you bring some other people in and then shop around and talk, get your kids uh, involved or your financial planner or somebody you know who who knows finance, but don't do financial deals in the dark because that's that's where they want you. That's where they want you, those scammers. Uh, contractor and home improvement scams, super, uh, super big, and especially when there's been a disaster in an area. Um, the... Uh, the home repair predators and vultures come flying in, but they are everywhere and they do travel around neighborhoods in sleepy little, sweet little neighborhoods where you never think anything's gonna happen. Somebody can come rolling down the street and get you talking about your roof and next thing you know, they're up there and uh, and they've got you convinced, uh, you or your client convinced that, they, uh, that you need a very expensive repair of some type. And it's not just roofs, it's all kinds of stuff. Next slide, please. <laughs> My apologies, that cough. So the grandparent and imposter scams, we call it generally the grandparent scam because it often presents as a child trying to convince uh, an older person that they are their grandchild or a child. They call it uh, crazy hours. Uh, older person may not be wearing the hearing aid or may have the TV too loud or who knows what's going on there. But 
they believe that this person who could be very convincing, sounds very frightened, has a dire uh, emergency on their hands, and they need that grandparent to wire some money. And a lot of folks have been seriously scammed by this. And it also can be kind of a progressive scam. <coughs> well, I apologize. Um, where uh, there's a first hit, then there's a second come around of another person who says, I can get him out of jail or I can get her out of jail if you send me money. And then there's a third one that says something else. And next thing you know, you've gone from an initial ask that sounded easy, like 500 or $1,000, that gets sent. And then the next ask is another 500 or 1,000 or 2,500. And, you know, I've heard that lots of grandparent scams um, can actually finally be known when the person is out 10 grand on two or three different transactions. So very, very prevalent, very successful, unfortunately, um, and still out there. But the biggest scam of all right now, we think, based on Sentinel data at the Federal Trade Commission, is romance scams. And that may have something to do, I'm guessing it does, with the amount of isolation that is going on with older people. And also, many, many, when we have a lot of older people, we have a lot of surviving spouses. So we have a lot of loneliness out there. And if you're lonely and you're isolated and somebody gets a hold of you either on a, you know, could be uh, it's often an online situation, but there is a myth that romance scams are only online scams. They are not. There are romance scammers in our community, in our faith communities. They are new friends that we meet um, out there, people who will take a shine to you, offer to help, offer to pay your bills, offer to do things, and um, and then uh, lay sort of romantic overtones to the conversation and reel in their, what I call a target. Um, there are charity scams out there always. They've always been around. Um, and, you know, so sob stories, sad stories. I heard one the other day. Somebody was trying to tell me that they needed money um, because you know, their car was broken down, they couldn't get home, their mother was dying, blah, 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 could I give them 20 bucks? It's not a charity scam, but it's that sort of, uh, you know, hard luck situation, but also charity scams are out there. And with the charity scams, they often change the name, like the American Heart Association, which is a real charity, might be the Heart Association of America. And so people can get that mixed up and think that they're giving to a, 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 a legitimate organization and they're not. Debt collection scams, they are giant and they are actually medical debt collection is a huge issue. Um, they may not necessarily be scams, but sometimes they again are perpetrated or perpetuated using unfair, deceptive and abusive practices. And then there will always be telemarketers and mail offers and salespersons. Um, I got invited to a free lunch seminar the other day Nice juicy steak for free if I would just come listen to somebody's pitch. Um, I almost went because I, I think that would be kind of fun to go. And, and honestly, my opinion, not the bureaus, I would love to see a bunch of us get really savvy, have an army of, of people on the streets get really savvy and start going to these free lunch seminars and asking the really tough questions and, and getting those answers that, uh, that they don't want to tell or not getting them and raising people's awareness. All right, next slide, please. So who are the abusers? Normally I would ask, who are the abusers? And have you put it in the chat? Um, but it's generally people either, there's two sets of people. There's people you know, people that are in your sphere of community, in your community, uh, family members, caregivers, hired or volunteer, friends, neighbors, acquaintances, Again, the fiduciaries, the agents under power of attorney, trustees, guardians, and government benefit uh, payees, such as social security benefit payees, social security, they're called rep payees, and also veterans uh, benefits, rep payees, um, and then financial professionals. And that, that could be anybody. It could also be you're an attorney. It could be a doctor. I've seen law enforcement officers that have ripped off older people. I mean, really and truly, it is often the intersection between greed or need, greed or need, and opportunity. So it can be anyone. Next slide. And often it is strangers 
And these are those telephone and mail scammers, the sort of phantom types. The internet scammers, you can't see the person, although they may have a lovely photo of themselves um, in, in military uniform or out on an oil rig or, uh, yeah, actually that happened to me yesterday. Somebody tried to friend me. I just popped up and said it would be rude for me to, you know, ask you to, to send you a friend request. So I'm sending you a message to ask if you'll be my friend. And it was this, you know, handsome middle-aged uh, military the guy and when I went and checked his profile, he had no friends. He'd been on the internet for about a week, and he claimed he was uh, based in Dover, uh, uh, Delaware. And uh, and I thought, you know, see you later. But a lot of people don't. They're lonely. They go for it. They they think they're talking to somebody real, and those people are smart, and they know how exactly to reel you in. Um, and then, of course, home repair contractors, um, they may seem like they're based in your neighborhood and maybe you know them through somebody or maybe you don't, but you really need to check them out and get lots and lots of, uh, you know, corroboration around uh, references and make sure their licenses are clean and, and that they are, you know, based in a brick and mortar somewhere near you and that they've got a lot to lose if they, uh, if they uh, rip you off. But that sometimes doesn't stop them, believe me. Um, and then, of course, if you're an SMP person here, we know Medicare scam operators are out there. And even though they're scamming Medicare, it does cost older people. And medical identity theft is another issue that is very, very painful for people to wind their way out of. Um, boy, the perils are many, aren't they? Uh, romance scammers, they as usually are strangers, but not always. Um, they can be people you know. Um, and then, of course, others, meaning everybody we haven't mentioned. Um, so, and so before we go to the next slide, who is at risk? I'm going to just have a quick peek at the chat. I'm not sure if we're getting, seem like we're getting responses. So maybe the chat has a little roadblock in it, or maybe I'm not seeing. That's entirely possible. Um, so there are sort of, how would you say, myths and misconceptions about who can be the victim of financial exploitation. Some people think it could, you've got to be someone with dementia or cognitive impairment, or you are financially unsophisticated, and, or you're just kind of, um, well, let's, I'm not gonna use any unkind words, but gullible might be a word that you would fall for such a thing. Well, the fact of the matter is anyone can be a victim of a scam or a fraud or financial exploitation. You do not have to be, have a cognitive impairment or a deficit of some sort. You, you could be very financially sophisticated and capable and still get scammed. You can have any education level, any um, socioeconomic level. You can go to the next slide, uh, Yolanda, please. It, it really truly, uh, financial exploitation really truly crosses all social, educational and economic boundaries. We've seen, you know, very uh, highly uh, savvy and sophisticated attorneys get scammed, and I've seen legislators get scammed. I've seen, uh, you know, bankers. Um, it just happens everywhere. Uh, but one of the things that makes it so important to, you know, get out there with older people and help them to empower them to say no and empower them to report and empower them to not feel shame about somebody else who should feel shame ripping them off. Um, one of the reasons is because when you are older, over 70, over, you know, over, even over 60, if you lose everything that you have saved your entire life for, I know how hard I've worked for 30 years in the workforce, maybe more, it's actually about 40. Um, I couldn't, I don't think at my age, I could recover all of that now if I lost everything. Um, I have, you know, benefited from having uh, time on my side with some of this. And that's another myth about uh, people, older people being exploited is that, you know, it only happens to people with money or it only matters if you have a lot of money. And that's not true. If you are an older person with, a, with very little money, a little is a lot. In fact, it can be even more devastating. Uh, 
you know, to be financially exploited, it, it has a greater impact. Um, you know, for a person who has millions of dollars who loses a hundred thousand, eh, you know, they may be injured uh, psychologically. Their trust can be blown. It can be very, you know, it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing to have happen. It's not right. But if you are someone who lives on a very fixed income and you need medicine and you need to be able to take the bus somewhere and you need to be able to feed yourself and et cetera on what 800, 900 a month, a thousand a month or less. If you lose 20 or $30 a week to somebody who's slipping uh, bills, uh, you know, a couple of a $20 bill or even a $10 bill out of your wallet every week, that's a lot of money. That's a big chunk of your income. And it can make the difference between people be, being able to remain independent or not, which can make a huge difference um, if someone loses their home or their ability to live independently at any age because of financial exploitation. It is devastating. All right, so now I'm going to hand off to Nicole um, so she can talk about the nuts and bolts of Money Smart for Older Adults. That rhymed. Awesome. I'll do this again next time. I'll be back. Thank you, Jennifer. So, as Jennifer mentioned, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of Money Smart for Older Adults. Uh, so, Money Smart for Older Adults was developed jointly by the FDIC and the CFPB as an instructor-led training. The program objectives are to rec recognize and reduce the risk of elder financial exploitation, guard against identity theft, plan for unexpected loss of the ability to manage finances, prepare financially for disasters, and find other helpful resources on managing money and reporting financial exploitation. Next slide, please. You'll see that the content of Money Smart is directed at teaching older adults to recognize and reduce the risk of elder financial exploitation, guard against identity theft, plan for unexpected loss of the ability to manage your finances, prepare financially for disasters, and find other helpful resources on managing money and reporting financial exploitation. Our objective is to make older people and their family members comfortable with the idea of take, talking about these issues, removing the taboo, and ultimately reporting these financial exploitation scams. Remember, reporting and early intervention are vital to preventing loss and recovering loss when possible. Let's spend some time discussing what the program covers. There are five topics we cover in this module. They include common types of financial exploitation, scams and target homeowners that, that target homeowners, scams targeting veterans, planning for unexpected life events, and how to be financially prepared for disasters. We recognize that scams are constantly changing. That is why the new version of Money Smart in Spanish includes new content on debt collection scams and imposter scams. Ultimately, the program will never be able to cover all forms of scams. That's why it's important to teach skills that can be applied to multiple situations. Remember, each of these segments can be taught collectively or independently of one another based on the interest of your audience. In 2019, the Money Smart for Older Adult program was awarded the, the American Society on Aging Gloria Cavanaugh Award for Excellence in Training and Education. Over 1 million copies of Money Smart for Older Adults have been distributed. There are three components of the Money Smart program. The instructor guide is fully scripted, is a fully scripted guide that enables volunteers and professionals from many disciplines to begin teaching the module right away. The resource guide is designed to support classroom instruction by providing key takeaways and can also be distributed to older persons and others on its own. And the PowerPoint presentation supplements classroom instruction. Please note the instructor guide and resource guide 
are in 14-point font, making it easier to read. The instructor guide and supporting material are also older adult friendly documents. Next slide, please. The instructor guide includes a presentation planning guide that is really meant for you to decide how to present the training. The entire Money Smart for Older Adults program has more than three hours of content. Therefore, the entire program is not meant to be delivered in one, sit one sitting. Most instructors or facilitators deliver it in 20 to 60 minute timeframes in specific trainings or presentations on a panel or an entire course delivered over multiple days. That is why we provide an overview of the modules and specific time frames for each so that you can plan your presentations accordingly. The guide also includes tips for presenting and all of the content that is included in the resource guide that you hand out to participants. The resource guides can be ordered in bulk at no charge from the CFPB at consumerfinance.gov backslash money smart. On this snapshot of the instructor's guide, you see the PowerPoint slide that correlates with the content along with the specific section of the resource guide that it's connected to. The resource guide includes information and activities, tools and instructions, a glossary of terms, and resources and information on where to report elder financial exploitation. The guide can be distributed as a standalone handout for distribution to older, older people, their caregivers, and others. It can also be shared at conferences or at a variety of events and locations, including senior housing communities, senior centers, faith-based communities, as well as local libraries and financial institutions. Money Smart for Older Adults has a participant evaluation form that includes pre and post knowledge question assessments and trainer training assessments. You can use some or all of the questions, but it is always good to gather some feedback. The evaluation results can help demonstrate effectiveness or can be shared with stakeholders who may be interested in collaborating. You don't have to limit yourself to the evaluation forms at the end of, at the end of the module. In fact, there are many activities throughout the training that serve as great ways to evaluate your work. You can use the activity results in the module and compare how people who took the training answer those compared to those who didn't complete the training. Of course, you can have your own measures. Often the best measures come in the form of, of success stories of people who after participating in the program helped someone in need or became trainers. For the first time, we are making the entire module available in Spanish. This includes the instructor guide. So the three resources are now available in Spanish and English. And as mentioned, the curriculum has the added benefit of being printed in 14 point font for ease of reading for older persons or older volunteer presenters. One of the key features is that the Spanish Money Smart for Older Adults curriculum in its entirety was developed to be as much as possible a mirror version of the English version. The goal is to make, a use, make it useful for both bilingual trainers and audiences. We know many, uh, many older adults live in bilingual households. So having these two resources with the same design and structure in both languages helps the older adult to share information with others. I'll now turn it back over to Jennifer, who will discuss implementing the Money Smart for Older Adults. Great, thank you, Nicole. Um, so, uh, in terms of implementation or taking it to the streets, as I like to say, um, there are two main ways to use the program. And that is um, independently by service providers, community based organizations, or others. Or, I'm sorry, you can go to the next slide. 
or as a tool for community partnerships with financial institutions, et cetera, or for financial institutions to develop community partnerships with independent organizations or service providers. And I wanna add one more, um, which is also another main way, but slides uh, updates haven't caught up to this yet. It's through collaboration with elder fraud prevention and response networks, which are increasingly uh, growing in number across the country. And I will talk a little bit about those later on uh, in the presentation, not too far down the line, but uh, these are organizations, they're usually based under your area agency on aging, which is a great way to find partners through an elder abuse task force, a coalition, um, a financial abuse specialist team, a multidisciplinary team on elder abuse or elder justice. So you can go to your local area agency on aging or AAA to find one. Uh, but it can be delivered independently or as a tool. Um, we definitely are encouraging adult protective services, law enforcement, senior service providers, aging service providers, legal service providers and whatnot to connect with those of you that are in financial institutions to team up to deliver Money Smart because you know the program, you've had the training, but conversely, you can get out to them as well, find them, join them, and there's a lot of benefits for you to do so. Sorry, you can go back a slide. Just so I can make sure I didn't miss, oh, nope, sorry. I had one slide, my eyes got crossed. All right, so law enforcement and adult protective services can collaborate with financial institutions and other stakeholders to co-present with you. Um, they can introduce their agency and share local stories. Um, Mostly, most financial institutions have really great stories. Well, they're never good stories, I take that back. But they are poignant and high impact stories about how financial exploitation um, presents itself in the community. And it's very believable when it's local. It's one thing to put a case sample or example into a PowerPoint or to speak of it abstractly like it happened somewhere in the universe. But when, it, when it's something that happened in this town, in this institution, or this law enforcement officer saw this happen, or prosecuted, or I should say investigated, and referred for, to prosecution a case, or one of you have a story as an instructor about how this touched you, it might even be your own family. I can tell you a couple of stories I'm not going to today, but about how elder financial exploitation has touched my family, and really speaking to the point that nobody is immune from it. It can happen to anyone. Local stories are really, really important to bring the message home and to make people feel like they're not alone, that this is happening everywhere, even here and to their neighbors and friends and in this community. Um, law enforcement and, and adult protective services or adult, adult social service agencies, legal services, if they come to your presentations or, or group meetings, which they may or may not be able to do, depending on how busy they are, but I encourage you to get with them um, and, and meet with them, or if you're one of them, meet with financial institutions and work out your collaboration and your network. Because if you can get to each other's presentations, you can help with you know, connecting with participants who may need help. Because a lot of times it's a big leap from hearing about a fraud or a scam and then actually reporting it or asking for help to untangle the mess that, that it creates when somebody has their identity um, stolen or or has a or needs a power of attorney rescinded or needs um, somebody to come and help them get rid of uh, someone who's living in their house or or a caregiver needs to be uh, taken out uh, of the home or whatnot. So being being collaborative and supporting each other in this is extremely important. I also want to mention that these key stakeholders, law enforcement and adult protective services, they deal with elder abuse um, and theft. And exploitation is a form of theft. You know, offshore scammers are not a direct physical th threat generally to an older person. They're a very significant threat to their uh, financial health and well being, which also can translate directly to their health and well being. But when the scammer or the fraudster or the exploiter or abuser is actually someone that is known to the person or is in their life as a family member or a community member, you know, this is when law enforcement and local adult protective services 
can be very, very helpful and can help protect the older person. So we strongly recommend that you engage with them and work with them because it's not just a scam or a fraud necessarily. A lot of times the older person is suffering very, can suffer very, very significant uh, effects from this, um, including depression. Um, and we've even seen older people commit suicide as a result of, uh, of the damage that is done by these losses. Next slide. So, uh, moving ahead here, engaging them to, we already had co-present, introduce agency, contact. You should contact or join your local multidisciplinary team. I think I did jump ahead and cover this. Our elder abuse task force or council, just know that they come by a lot of different names. Sometimes they're very open to uh, community members to join. And sometimes they have only a case review function and the case review function can be quite confidential. So they may say, oh, no, thanks. We don't have an open forum. And you could say, well, I uh, am trained in Money Smart for Older Adults. Are you familiar with it? Um, would you like, you know, do you need help with a, a speaker situation? Do you get requests for speakers? Can I join, join forces with you? Maybe help you start a speakers bureau? Um, this is what we need is a lot of boots on the ground. And sometimes, you know, these uh, stakeholders, uh, intermediaries and responders are so busy and so overwhelmed just managing cases and whatnot, they, they can't even squeeze in prevention. And so if you could bring that element to the table, I'm sure it would be greatly appreciated and any support you can provide. Um, and then just a tip is it, the setting outreach goal for the number of presentations. Once you have a speakers bureau or a group working to get out there with Money Smart for Older Adults, we have found it beneficial that, you know, if you can challenge people to say, let's see how many we can reach this year. And I remember D uh, DC uh, Office on Aging took on Money Smart for Older Adults in about 2015 or thereabouts. And I challenged them to say, how many seniors gonna, are you gonna reach this year? And they said, oh, we'll try to get to 500. And I said, very good, just call a number. And they came back to me at the end of the year and they had reached over 1300 seniors, but it wasn't be just on their own. The fact that they set out to reach 500, but they discovered that they were very popular in the community and they got asked to go to more presentations. And next thing you knew, they, they had more presentations than they could deal with and they needed to increase their uh, speakers bureau and train trainers and then they reached 1300 and then the year after, I don't think they doubled it, but they got upwards of, I think they got over 2000 the next year. So that's just what that uh, bullet points about. Next slide. So there's no shortage of venues and do not let a list um, contain you at all um, or, or bridle you in any way. You should feel unbridled about this. Um, when I was uh, back in San Francisco, way before I joined the Bureau, um, and was working on elder uh, elder financial exploitation work with the F FDIC office in San Francisco, I was asked to go to a sewing group, a woman who I believe she was in a faith community group that we, um, myself and a, and a couple of others went to uh, present. Um, this was pre-Money Smart, but it's, it was the genesis of Money Smart, those early days, and uh, Money Smart for older adults, I should be specific. Anyway, we were invited, somebody came up and said, could you come to our sewing group on a Saturday? And I thought, oh, working Saturdays, not, not excited about that. I said, why do you need me to come to a sewing group? And she said, well, because we have a member who we are sure is being scammed by a sweepstakes scam and we don't know what to do. She doesn't want to believe us and whatnot. So I thought, well, okay. I said, but don't, I said, you know, should I come as a speaker? And she said, no, you need to be the girl next door and come with cookies. And so I did. And I was able to, you know, just hang out. I brought some mending, sat with them with my needle and thread and mended some jeans or something. And they said, so, Jen, what do you do? And I said, oh, I work to protect older people from financial exploitation. And everybody's eyes went, hmm. And the woman looked up and I knew right away which one she was. And, say, and they said, what's that about? And then I gave just a very casual presentation based on this information that's in Money Smart for Older Adults. And my understanding is that 
she uh, got it. And then they were able to support her and help her. And that's actually a big part of this, is support for people. I don't like to use the word victim. I like to use the word survivor. Um, that yes, there is victimization that takes place, but those who, who you know, are on the other side of being targeted and are being helped are in the process of being survivors. So don't let your venues be, you know, libraries are fantastic. Uh, research research uh, librarians are fantastic to connect with. They have community rooms, um, obviously senior centers, obviously senior congregate senior housing, faith community groups often have older adult ministries and the like, retirement groups, sons in retirement, uh, uh, Knights of Columbus, uh, the key clubs, um, thinking of Kiwanis and whatnot. Uh, there is no shortage and be careful what you wish for, because you go to one and then you'll get 2 or 3 people probably say, could you come to my group? So, once you start, uh, that's why I say have a few people available. Next slide please. Um, if you are planning uh, to put on a presentation, I say soup to nuts. Um, you know, you need to fasten your seatbelt and give yourself a lot of advanced time. Like it takes a good 2 to 2 months minimum. But more likely three months to plan a session. You need to, and especially now when we're considering whether it's going to be online, which you can do a shorter time frame on, or if it's going to be in person, um, or some hybrid, which I don't highly recommend at this point because they're still a little dicey the hybrids. But um, you know, you need to think about your audience's needs. If you're if you're picking a location, you know, easy parking. The time of day has to be considered. You don't want to do it too early. You don't want to do it too late. Think about rush hour traffic. Um, we used to find that 1030 in the morning till noon um, was great. As long as you're not interfering with a bingo game nearby, keep that in mind. Do not interfere with bingo. Um, that was became a big. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, do not interfere with bingo. Um, so date, place, and time is extremely important. Um, after lunch from 1 to 2.30 or 2 to 3.30 is good. Um, I would not go more than 90 minutes. I think uh, uh, Nicole mentioned that earlier. 60 minutes is good with 15 minutes of Q&A. You could do 60 minutes with a 10-minute break, come back for Q&A, let people get up and stretch. That's good. Um, I would not do more than a 90-minute spell. Um, and uh, you know, you can get lots of handouts and whatnot ahead of time. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, look for potential partnerships. Finance, you know, the, we say to elder justice uh, professionals and senior service providers or aging service providers to look at the role of financial institutions and try to engage financial institutions because you're on the front line. You see these transactions, older people come in, you know, every Friday or whatever their schedule is, they like in person. Banking for the most part, although they're getting better about using online banking, but still the role of financial institutions is very, very significant and it's very significant in terms of building collaboration around uh, reporting and investigations. So, and conversely, financial institution people, it is extremely important that you connect with APS law enforcement legal services and if necessary, even take the lead in your community. To establish an elder fraud prevention and response network, a MEMDT, a FAST team, a coalition, et cetera. Sometimes it hasn't happened yet, and you can take that leadership role and put that feather in your cap. Um, the content of classes in the instructor guide, you'll see what used to be called a layering table. I don't think it's called that now, but it um, but it helps you to plan. It's like a session planning tool that helps you to decide what content that you can provide in a what period of time. And you may even want to lay out a series. Consider laying out a series of three classes over six weeks or or over three weeks or whatever, but, but, but not more than an hour and a half or two hour session. Actually, if you do a two hour session, you could add a little uh, panel of local resources with legal aid or whatnot, legal services being one of the speakers. Um, and which speaks to formatting of classes and then, of course, incentives, um, if you happen to have freebies and giveaways um, and, you know, can do door prizes or whatever, those always liven up and make the learning fun.
fun. Um, if you can come up with a, you know, even a little potted plant or a, the, the big favorites in the old days, speaking from experience, were like a gift certificate or a little gift card to Red Lobster or even McDonald's, where a lot of older people like to go for coffee and meat. Um, but you know, little 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 items that you can uh, you can do as a as a gift at the end or whatnot for uh, those that stay the whole time, and then most of them will. Next slide, please. So marketing strategies, um, you know, it, it seems like a big job, but you might find that it's it's fairly easy because the the community partners are not a vast number of people. But you know, having a database of community partners is great. People you can call upon, people you can invite, people you can pull together for a meeting, people you can do a train the trainer with or exchange information about each other's uh, each other's uh, organizations. Um, you can engage your partners and sponsors in promotion, but you got to have them first. That's why we say develop the database or join an existing database, an existing network or collaboration uh, group. Um, promotional opportunities, they are vast. You can be very creative about that. And that's another great way that financial institutions can help um, with these efforts is because you usually have marketing staff or training staff or others on your uh, team who are already doing a lot of promotion and marketing of products and services. So it isn't that hard um, to plug in a little bit of time to help uh, promote these kinds of events. And that's exactly what's going on today with World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Yesterday, there was a massive global summit and uh, JP Morgan Chase was the lead sponsor on it. And it was in nine countries. I'd say that was pretty good for them to have their name at the top of that. Um, and you can go to uh, the National Adult Protective Services Association, NAPSA, and look at that event and get an idea of, you know, that's a big event, but you can get an idea of, of how you can position um, yourselves and others in the community to promote legal services, promote APS, promote law enforcement, and promote your organization um, it, for the work you're doing. And, and promoting yourself as resources, not so much as uh, for, for marketing, even though that's implicit, of course. Um, so all of this is pretty straightforward, circulating promotional material, uh, encouraging partner organizations. Um, this is referring individuals uh, to the pre presentation, obviously, um, is individuals, but also getting other stakeholders to engage in a larger effort. Next slide, please. Um, things to consider, especially these days, uh, racial and and uh, economic equity. Um, you know, rural populations, mar marginalized populations. Uh, we are learning more and more and more about how to reach people in rural areas, and I can't. I could do a whole course on just that, so I won't. But that is a huge focus these days because you know a lot of people who go to senior centers every week. Are getting a lot of information and they're and they have contact with folks at, you know, at the desk, et cetera, reaching isolated. Hard to reach older people or people who are, you know. Marginalized for some re reason or another, there can be many reasons. Are, is very challenging and um, and that is what I'm challenging you to do. Um, and then, of course, considering the, the potential challenges and impediments. I would say give yourself lots of time when you're planning events. Um, look for ways to embed this work in other programming. Sometimes it's just 10 minutes worth. You don't have to do an entire Money Smart for Older Adults training, but you can take this content and you can put it uh, in, you know, like web announcements. You can you can send out text uh, alerts. You could, you know, there's just a lot of ways to disseminate information. You can use the copy in newsletters, it's not copyrighted. Please take it and run with it. It's needed on the streets and this is another way of reaching hard to reach people. <coughs> uh, media outreach is enormous. And if you're a financial institution or a, a well-connected or well-resourced uh, or industrious nonprofit organization, hopefully you have media contacts and you can help create media events around Money Smart for Older ad Adults trainings or you can create a elder justice expo for a day or tack on to a, a flu clinic in the fall 
and make these I, these materials available and maybe have a speaker. So be creative. Uh, be creative if you're passionate and creative, and then you've got this to uh, to work with. You've got it made, and then a whole bunch of people will benefit. And then always look for ways to measure success. And if you as you as you do so, share that with the partners, especially your nonprofit partners. Measuring success is really important, and there is increasingly more grant funding available for older adult issues, including and maybe especially elder financial exploitation. But we have to be able to measure success. We have to be able to count, you know, what we're doing, how many we reached, and and even more than that. All right, snapshot of the module. Um, we. Let's just zip through this really quickly because we've kind of sort of had a snapshot of the module, but the recent update, and I believe this was last year, unless I'm missing a year because I have COVID brain around how long it has actually been. My years are sort of blending together, but we did update the, I'm thinking this was 20, yeah, so that was last year. What is a romance scam? So we added romance scam content, you go to the next slide. I'm not going to go through it with a fine tooth comb, but you can get a snapshot. Um, what scammers may do, uh, there's all kinds of tricks that they use to, you know, separate people from their money. And, and I will say, just to give you an idea of a local story, my cousin, who I will not name, of course, never name anybody, um, is in her 60s. She is a surviving spouse, very lonely, and she knows what I do for a living. She knows that my expertise, but she really, truly believed that this military guy who was based on an oil rig in Houston, which doesn't even make sense, but she went for it. She lost her entire $40,000 savings last year, right before we released this content. And I couldn't believe that I couldn't believe she didn't talk to me about it, but that's how pervasive this is. Next slide, please. Um, right here at the top. In person scams next slide. Uh, some romance scams happen in person. Uh, people are socially isolated or dependent. It could be a person you meet at your church community center or a social group. I really like to highlight this because there is. A very strong or very pervasive belief, and I will say in Washington and amongst others, that romance scams are only online situations. And I will tell you right now, the first scam, the first instance of elder financial exploitation I ever witnessed was in, let me think here, 19, <laughs> I'm dating myself. It was in the mid 1990s. And it was a pastor of a local church who was visiting older women in the evening. And he was coming up with stories about emergencies that the church couldn't pay for. And he was getting them to write him checks anywhere from 50 bucks to 300 bucks. And when I, one of my early clients, when I was back in working home health, uh, when I looked at her checkbook, she, she told me that she had to write him another check and I looked at her checkbook. She had given him seven or eight thousand dollars that year for emergencies. So it is very pervasive in our community. Next slide, please. So here's some more warning signs. We can go to the next slide. How to get help. Great. Um, and now we'll just move on. I'm going to share some resources with you. It's 414. I'm going to leave some time here at the end. Um, if you are interested in establishing an elder fraud prevention and response network, or if you already belong to one and you would like to enhance your capacity, build capacity, um, do some strategic planning, this is a great resource. It's a, it is going to be updated in a couple of months. It's a good resource now. It's going to be a great resource in the fall, but there's some really, you know, fantastic tools and it's at consumerfinance.gov forward slash elder networks. It is uh, 23 web pages that are not heavily populated, so it won't take you long to get through them. And there are 10 downloadable tools. Here it is. Thank you for hopping me forward here. Um, so you can you can go on there and you can find all sorts of info. And um, and then I'm happy to help you if you have specific questions or would like to engage or you would like to be trained as a facilitator 
um, for a network convening. Um, we are scaling up this program and we're looking for trainers to train on how to either establish or enhance the capacity of existing networks. And networks can actually use, this is a big deal, uh, Money Smart for Older Adults can be your community education and uh, an outreach program. Next slide. So this is just a, a quick snapshot of the guide. You'll get these slides later, but it's basically plan a retreat, host a retreat, reconvene and establish your network or enhance, or enhance your network and expand your network's capabilities. So next slide. We're just gonna run on into um, some of our resources. We have a, a lot of free resources that you can order when you're doing your presentations um, or you can just have them around in your office. You can share them with libraries. I keep a car full and I, my husband's car is full of resources too, because uh, whenever we come by a library, it's, er, we go in and say, hey, do you have this stuff? And we drop them off a bunch of stuff and they're always very happy. Um, so considering a financial caregiver, this is for people who are choosing uh, a financial caregiver who could be informal like a power of attorney or could be more formal like a uh, a, a guardian or a conservator or a trustee. Um, and, you know, it's just so important to choose the right person because many people do it by tradition, the oldest son who might have drug, alcohol, or money management problems. And same with daughters. I don't mean to be sexist about it. Um, but choosing a financial caregiver is extremely important. Advanced planning for cognitive, you know, cognitive impairment or diminished capacity that could be a result of anything. It doesn't have to be a long-term situation. And we also have these tools for financial caregivers, uh, managing someone else's money guides for all those different types of fiduciaries I mentioned. This is a guide for the fiduciaries on what their roles are, the rules of the road, and how to do, how to do a good job. Um, so keep going here, we're almost done. Um, we have lots and lots of publications you can go to consumerfinance.gov forward slash older Americans. And I hate to say it, but that little dash is not in there anymore. That, that got taken out a couple months ago. It's just straight up consumerfinance.gov older Americans. And then, of course, there's the Ask CFPB. I just want to touch on that we also have helpful materials for older adults who are considering a reverse mortgage. Um, you can just flip through the next slide. Um, and the, so this is the guide for older people or family members, caregivers, financial caregivers, yourselves. If you are thinking about a reverse mortgage, this has a really nice little checklist in it as to help you decide whether it is the right product for you. Um, and then we also have a reverse mortgage uh, discussion guide, um, which helps you to talk about reverse mortgages with other people. They are complicated. Um, without the guide, I would not be able to talk to people about it myself. Um, but this is a really great little, um, a little tool for intermediaries. And then the next one slide is uh, your reverse mortgage after a, nat a natural disaster. Um, and we also have a reverse mortgage page. Next slide. Um, and then just very quickly, I'm not even going to hit the slides on this, but go to the next slide. Um, whoop. My own, yes, I do have that slide. So here's a, just a sample of the reverse, reverse mortgage resource page on our website. Okay, hope you're not too dizzy yet. Um, so profile of, we just released a snapshot, which is a profile of older adults living in mobile homes. And it's based on uh, Census Bureau Household Pulse Survey. And next slide, it defines mobile homes. It talks about, next slide, 3.2 million older people who live in mobile homes. Um, it talks about how they tend to be women. Next slide, you got that, good. And then the next one is how they tend to have lower incomes. This is speaking to housing security, which is a big theme this month. Um, older adults who live in mobile homes tend to be persons living outside the 14 largest metropolitan areas. Next slide. Um, and most who people who live in mobile homes own their own home without any mortgage. However, next slide, they are equally burdened by housing costs as compared to older adults residing in other housing settings. So some very interesting insights that just came out. And next slide, how they struggle to afford their living, uh, 
expenses and they face greater housing insecurity than their peers living in other housing settings. And there's some very disturbing trends around that. Um, so, you know, higher rates of, of uh, economic and health impacts in COVID. And um, the next slide says, thank you very much, but I'm not done yet. So I'm just going to do one more thing. Um, if you don't mind, uh, we just also, and there is no slide for this. So while you're taking down my, my, uh, <laughs> you'll get these slides, I believe, but, um, while you're looking at my contact information, we just released last week a, um, a spotlight, which is a data spotlight on surviving spouses and the financial challenges that are faced by recently widowed adults. So I'll just run through the headlines on these. How many surviving spouses are there? 12.3 million widowed women and three to five million widowed men. Um, and 13.4 million of these widowers are 60 and older. I'll stop there. You can go get it yourself and read it. Um, and who are these new surviving spouses? More than likely to be women. You just got that. There's the characteristics of recently widowed uh, adults 60 plus, and what are the risks that surviving spouses face? Drops in income, housing cost burdens, isolation, limited access to critical support, missing out on federal and state benefits, and a much greater risk of mortality. And then we have um, complaints, uh, you know, some of some snapshot complaints from our complaint database on surviving spouses, info on their income and earnings, so there is just, you know, a lot of really great information here, although a lot of it is very jarring um, and very, uh, uh, frankly, disturbing and upsetting, but actionable on our part. Um, and it talks about the poverty amongst newly widowed individuals, um, housing cost burdens. And since we're in housing mode, 79% own their own homes, 19% are renters, 2% live in other arrangements. Um, 28% of newly widowed homeowners face mortgage debt. 33% of newly widowed, widowed homeowners spent 30% of their income on housing costs. 30% plus. 67% uh, of newly widowed renters spent 30% more of their income in housing. And COVID-19 pandemic is exacerbated housing, has exacerbated housing insecurity and housing costs for older adults. So I will. Uh, I think I will stop there. There's a, there's a few more slides here that I'm I'm looking at, um, but I think you get the idea. And if you go to consumerfinance.gov four slash older Americans no dash four slash older Americans, you can get. Hello, everyone. So, yes, thank you, Ron, for the introduction. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you, Jennifer, for all the information that you have provided today. Um, my name is Yolanda Green. I'm going to show you, tell you how you can connect with the FDIC. So, the FDIC staff are located across the country to assist you. We connect communities as well as financial institutions with each other. We have the Money Smart Alliance program. You can join the FDIC's Money Smart Alliance program. The FDIC recognizes organizations that contribute to the delivery of the Money Smart curriculum to consumers and small businesses through the Money Smart Alliance program. Alliance members promote the Money Smart curriculum by teaching Money Smart or training others to teach it, and, to, and by supporting the consumers and small businesses that use Money Smart. Alliance members also provide feedback and successful uses of the, of the program to the FDIC to help improve the Money Smart program. Organizations eligible to join the Alliance include financial institutions, colleges and universities, federal agencies, K-12 schools, as well as nonprofit organizations and state or local governments. The organizations participate in undertakings that include but are not limited to, limited to additional teaching opportunities, hosting classes, facilitating program implementation, promoting the Money Smart program, and increasing Money Smart delivery and distribution networks. To submit a request for membership, visit fdic.gov forward slash Money Smart.
So you can visit our website to find Money Smart News success stories in seven different categories, which is FDIC's newsletters featuring tips, updates, and success stories for financial educators. We welcome your submissions at moneysmartnews at fdic.gov. There's also success stories from organizations that have used the Money Smart for Adults curriculum and our other curriculums as well. Here on this particular slide, you'll see the FDIC Consumer Resources slide. You can find information on the FDIC's Consumer News. There's information on FDIC's Affordable Mortgage Lenders Lending Center. You can find information about the FDIC's Money Smart program, as well as FDIC Beware of Mortgage Rescue Scams, and our Get Bank hashtag, which is a resource to help you get started in banking and relationships and which generally begin with a checking and savings account and may lead to low interest loans and mortgages. Hashtag Get Bank is available in both English and Spanish. So to learn more about the FDIC's Money Smart program, you can visit our website at fdic.gov forward slash Money Smart. You can learn about the Money Smart program. program. You can order or download our products. There's ideas to use the Money Smart program. There's ways that you can join the Money Smart Alliance. And there's Money Smart videos that you can take a look at and watch in your training. So at this time, um, I don't I think a lot of people uh, were able to get into the WebEx platform. So I think most of the people were on call. Um, so uh, if you have, if you are in the, the platform, um, we can have take some questions and answers. And if you uh, let's open up, actually let's open up the phone lines and see if there are any calls or questions um, that may want to be answered. Let's see. It doesn't look like it looks like a lot of people have called in, so they may not have that capability to actually raise their hand. Um, so I can't see whether or not you have a question or not. And there weren't that many features in the chat message. So I don't know if there were um, any questions that came in. Like I said, a lot of people were having issues logging in. And I believe it's probably due to um, maybe not having the latest update on WebEx platform. Um, but we are looking into what is going on and we'll take a look at and see if we can figure out what the issue is. Um, however, we will be providing the PowerPoint presentation uh, to all of the attendees that have registered. Um, so let's just move on and um, see. How can you reach us? Like I said, if you have comments or questions, you can email us at community affairs at FDIC.gov. Our Money Smart website is FDIC.gov forward slash Money Smart. So at this time, um, we're going to just close out. And like I said, if you have any questions, you can contact us at Community Affairs at FDIC.gov. And our Money Smart website is FDIC.gov forward slash Money Smart. I want to thank everyone for joining us for this training. Um, we apologize if you could not get into the session, but we hope you did call in and listen and receive this valuable information. Um, as, like I said before, the PowerPoint presentation will be sent to all attendees. And I want to thank you all again for joining us and staying online um, for this particular training and enjoy the remainder of your day. Thank you so much.